is Medina Assefi, and I'm the Continuing Education Coordinator here at Microdental Laboratories. Thank you guys for joining us this evening. Well, this very smoky evening in California. Hopefully, it's a bit more clear where you're located. Um, on how airway and dental sleep medicine is tied to outcomes in general dentistry with Dr. Jerry Hu. Um, before we begin, I'd like to go over a couple things regarding CE. Um, please be sure to stay for the entire duration of the webinar in order to receive your CE credit. Uh, minutes of your attendance will be recorded. Um, also, once the webinar has concluded and you've exited the Zoom uh, window, a browser should appear instructing you to complete a CE evaluation form. Please uh, do that as well in order to receive your CE credit. Um, also, this whole uh, entire webinar will be recorded and uploaded onto our microdental website, so you will have access to that at any time you would like to see. And also, there will be um, previously recorded webinars that you can check out too. We have a lot of them from this past year. Um, uh, in addition to during this webinar, we will have a Q&A portion where you can ask Dr. Hu questions uh, about his presentation and he will have um, some time to answer your questions. And if he can't get to your questions, you can email him directly and he will follow up with you. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and give the stage to Dr. Hu and that rhymed. So cool, have a great presentation. Hello. Let's see. Can everyone see me and see the slide presentation? I just want to verify. Okay. So, Medina, can you unmute and make sure you, you can just verify that you can hear me and see everything? Is that correct? Correct. I can see it all. Okay, fantastic. So, I'm going to go ahead and start. Can you shut the door, Stephen? Thank you so much. All right. Uh, it is my pleasure today to do this. Um, webinar for all your folks. Um, you know, this is something that is personally, um, I have a sleep apnea and I went through a whole um, journey through treating myself and I'll be able to share that tonight. But I just want to um, touch the basics on, you know, why it's so important for us, uh, especially uh, during these COVID pandemic times, as well as just, you know, looking beyond the teeth and looking at your patients and trying to treat them holistically and looking at them as an entire person who's quality of life and health all matter. Now, I do want to say some things uh, just right off the bat that there are going to be some slides uh, that have a lot of evidence base, meaning literature citations. It's important. I know they get a little bit busy on those slides, um, but they're there because this is recorded as a source of reference, uh, especially when we talk about things in the past that's been kind of not exactly controversial, but debated like sleep bruxism and the connection uh, to dentistry and airway. And it's been important because I've seen over and over again where all the dentistry that I do absolutely has a connection and correlation uh, to airway and if the patient has sleep breathing disorders, obstructive sleep apnea or not. So uh, very important on that. Now, I am very passionate about dental sleep medicine, so um, I wanted to do it methodically so that I give a good presentation um, and that I don't skip anything for people uh, coming at different levels, if you will. I know some of you have already uh, been seasoned dental sleep medicine dentists, as well as others are just looking at finding that connection to de general dentistry, as well as that, you know, maybe you've done a couple of cases or whatnot. And absolutely, if there's time, I would love to answer questions. However, uh, with me, if you've been to some of my webinars and actual seminars, I tend to run over. So um, it's okay. I will not get offended if you guys were to leave early. I guess, you know, it's it's uh, these pandemic times, I totally get a people's time schedule and whatnot, but I'm just happy that you're here. And once again, um, I will uh, definitely try my best to, to not go over too long and answer all the questions. Okay. So... I just wanna give some disclosures, of course. Uh, I do speak for a lot of organizations and societies, um, but um, there's uh, nothing here uh, that is being uh, specified. I'm just passion passionate about uh, microdental and that their um, uh, array of, of uh, um, dental sleep uh, medicine appliance options to doing full mouth reconstruction cases, to implant cases, all of them, they, 
they uh, are one service that provide all of it. So it's very important that I have disclosures that yes, I do work with a lot of different groups and associations and sit on some certain boards. So our agenda today is we're gonna actually, since it is pandemic times, we're gonna talk about how uh, sleep medicine and how that ties into our general dentistry and also everything that we're concerned with from economy to just business. Um, and you know, American Dental Association recently came out with a lot of statistics about you know patients still being fearful. Are we seeing you know pre-COVID conditions versus after COVID conditions? Is the business running the same? And of course, not even till I would think mid to late next year. Um, you know, you will find that uh, we may not get 100% back to normal in terms of business. I then will share my personal journey. Um, I think it's a good way to really let you guys know why I'm so passionate about this because it's affected every aspect of my life. Um, you know, I'm a son, I'm a husband, I'm also a father of three wonderful, uh, cute little boys. And so, yes, my health, my everything is important. And, and I'll share some slides and photos of what my life was like. And you guys can understand as dentists or in the dental uh, field, how much stress and things can really, you know, take a, a toll uh, on our uh, our overall health and, and lifestyle. Then I'll kind of go over some basics on the introduction of dental sleep medicine, just kind of go over some prevalence and some numbers and statistics. And we'll kind of finish with, a, you know, just a few slides on just billing and, and things like that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so let's go ahead and, okay. I have to use my mouse cursor, so I apologize. I thought my keyboard was working, but I'm just using the roller thing. So if I accidentally go an extra slide, just be patient with me. So. Right now, we know that, right, there's a lot of studies coming out. This is a novel virus, right? So we have so many statistics, and I know, like, CDC, you know, says one thing one minute, sometimes says another thing, and backtracks and whatnot. But one thing every doctor, everybody in the healthcare profession can agree on is um, – our immune system is so vital, it's so important to be the best that it can be if we were to get any type of infection, not just COVID-19, right? But not only that, uh, we know that there's so many comorbidities, right? Uh, recently, CDC just came out uh, with that, I guess, 6% uh, statistic or something like that, but it was really relating to comorbidities. And if you have sleep apnea, you better bet, whether it's cardiovascular risk um, from stroke, you saw earlier we had that looping video of, of statistics and prevalence, uh, but all the way to Alzheimer's dementia, to cancer, uh, to metabolic syndrome, diabetes, all those things are connected, right? So if we need Need to be at our best. Sure, you can take uh, some vitamin supplements. Sure, you can do uh, all those things uh, that to help your immune system boost. But I'm telling you, the N3 Delta Wave Deep Sleep, uh, that's when your body is repairing. That's when the immune system is getting really at its best. So keep that in mind. If you have a patient that comes in, we review their health history, they have multiple systemic issues going on, they already have comorbidities. Well, you better bet that having good sleep and solid sleep, if they were to get COVID, is gonna make a dramatic difference, right? And so, let me go ahead with my mouse again, sorry about that. There was a recent study uh, done in Finland right, that talks about the, the connection and the prevalence. And they all show that the oxygen desaturation levels uh, went way down. And uh, you have to say, well, duh. I mean, if throughout the night the patient can't breathe well and they're having oxygen deficiency and the body responds by a, a sympathetic overdrive, you can see that not only are they always inflamed with, you know, cytokines, inflammatory cortisol, all those bad gunky stuff, right? But they're not healthy. And when they're not healthy, that's when things like COVID-19 or if you have anything that's immunocompromised, opportunistic, like HIV, right? Sometimes people say, well, you have HIV, but HIV is not really what killed. You know, you're immune compromised, you catch a cold, and you don't have enough uh, Im immune system to fight T cells to fight the issue. So that's very, very important to keep in mind at these times. So having a um, connection with your patient and going just beyond where I'm just going to do a filling today or whatnot and say, hey, you know what? We're all very concerned about COVID, about how if we do catch it or if we do get infected, what is the best way I can uh, beat that, right? So that's very important. And the patients really appreciate going beyond. Another thing too is we know that um, 
uh, through the American Dental Association, uh, ADA, excuse me, a dental association, and other um, uh, um, organizations, they're very concerned about aerosols. And I think there was just a recent article that came out that said something about hospital aerosols and having that connection uh, with the transmission or infection rate. So we know that dental seat medicine entirely could be done aerosol free. As a matter of fact, I posted a, a clinical pearl uh, post one time, and I know several dentists actually went on and said that they haven't picked up a, a high-speed handpiece for years doing dental sleep medicine. So, you know, especially if you're out of school right now and you're worried about all the student debt and the loans, if you're worried about, you know, can I do something where uh, people uh, at least can uh, minimize or mitigate all these, you know, things that they hear, dental sleep medicine, absolutely is something you should look into. But of course, I'll give you a whole slew of reasons uh, down the road uh, as well. Just kind of building and, and really taking the effect of how a sleep medicine can be beneficial, not just from a business standpoint, but also uh, you'd be differentiating your practice to other people around your community. Thanks. You know, people will say, gosh, when I go to Dr. So-and-so, they're not just looking at my teeth and my periodontal and, and dental stuff, but they're looking at my overall health and my ability to be the best I can be uh, to fight COVID. And it just goes a long ways. Um, so think about that. And then, of course, um, you know, people always have these cliches nowadays, the new normal and whatnot. I really don't think, especially, you know, all the predictions that we thought, we thought initially, oh, we're just going to have to tough it out for a few months, you know, flatten the curve. Um, and then, you know, you can just look at the stock market, how volatile, how crazy it is, right? It's sort of like, well, that's our future. But, you know, uh, when I got out of dental school as a dentist, I always like to be grounded on something. I always like to be prepared. I always like to have something to fall back on. And I just, you know, Know, can't underscore that dental seat medicine really is uh, the future. It's connected to everything. We'll show statistics and things down the road, but just have that in mind that this is why I'm here today and why I partner with um, Microdental and Mac Studio because they are just a one service all in all out, but uh, we'll, we'll see uh, even more detail as to why. Some of the hesitations I see in certain dentists uh, or, you know, because it's, it's kind of, you know, you're going to put on a medical hat. Um, and there's sort of this notion. It's interesting because when I go uh, overseas, you know, dentists are respected just as much as the eye doctor, um, ophthalmologist to the medical doctor to the psychiatrist. Uh, but sometimes in the U.S. and maybe even Canada, um, there's kind of either a submissive or sub, uh, some kind of sub role with dentists. So we sometimes kind of say, well, you know, we get a little bit uh, apprehended or afraid. But I'll tell you, um, after doing years of dental sleep medicine, it's really, it's a no, don't be afraid of it. Um, of course, uh, take education, CE can do education courses, have medical billing um, uh, partners. Now, Microdental uh, does have uh, a, a uh, that I have a slide at the end that is a, is, a, is a group of people that can help with medical billing. We'll go into some of that a little bit in detail, as well as getting your dental team members members on. Um, they're so critical, um, you know, and I think that assistants and hygienists and all of them, they feel empowered. They, they're like nurse practitioners. You know, they go beyond just teeth. They're talking about whole systemic and comorbidities and quality of life changes. So, so it's really a win-win. I just can't underscore that over. Some of the slides, they may be a repeat, but those ones are very important. I just want to make sure that they're highlighted in people. Um, are not uh, um, going to forget those pearls, if you will, those most important pearls. So the prevalence and how serious this is, and this is one slide that kind of is going to be repeated. Um, I, there's over 1 billion with a B people in the world who are underdiagnosed and undertreated with sleep apnea. Okay, and so this is very serious because we know already all the comorbidities. We know that this can kill people. This can, uh, you know, decrease lifespan. There's so many things, uh, um, energy. And actually, if you are thinking about, you know, shift workers, commercial truck drivers, airline pilots, oh my goodness, you know, we're now finding more and more uh, news, which are sad news, about how their lack of sleep and their um, fragmented sleep has contributed either to an accident or many 
mean death. So these are very, very important for us to, to highlight and underscore. So I'm going to go to my own story. So you can see that this is a, a slide of myself. I was at the Mission of Mercy, and, uh, you know, kudos for all those people who donate their time. But you can see I was significantly, I was a hundred more than 100 pounds heavier than I am my, right now. So when you look at the BMI index, I'm considered uh, obviously obese. One thing you can see that when I was doing the Mission of Mercy, um, I did maybe just a couple of fillings at that juncture, but look at my forehead. It's full of sweat and perspiration. Um, you can think about that, my body, you know, trying to breathe. Think about oxygen, think about hypertension, high blood pressure, all those things, right? And I was sitting stationary. I was like doing like, you know, sit-ups, push-ups, pull-ups, chin-ups, nothing like that. And I was sweating to that that amount. But that time, at that time, I was not into dental sleep medicine. I did not get my airway address. It. All those things were going on. So I even remember some of my assistants back then, they would take my blood pressure because they are just worried about my systemic health all the time, right? And I was on two... Uh, hypertension medications, hydrochlorothiazide, loop direct, and the calcium channel blocker of rapamil. And sometimes, yeah, I mean, I would see my um, diastolic go above 100. And I know myself, you know, in the healthcare profession that, uh, Jerry, this is not very good for you. Uh, this is very serious. And at night, I would wake up uh, gasping, choking for air. My wife, Sharon, would like freak out. Um, I would have acid reflux and I would <gasps> choke. And, you know, it's that kind of uh, effort, like, especially during REM, you know, I'll talk about it later, where I I'm trying to, you know, paradoxical breathing, trying to get air in and then do my abdomen, boom, acid goes up. And, you know, that's linked to so many things from esophageal cancer to whole nine yards. So this is really serious stuff. You know, I was tired a lot. Um, and, you know, I had joint and ache pain and I, I couldn't exercise very well. You know, I was very much overweight. So those things kind of all fall together. So this is my own history. Now, I was at the Legoland. So I know uh, you guys in uh, Micro General in California. So this is at Legoland and you see that I'm on a uh, ride with my boy and um, you know, I'm just sitting there with a smile, but I'm actually really ashamed of myself at this photo. Why I say that is because we were in line to do this ride and uh, a couple, uh, a guy and his child cut in front of us and I totally lost it. I mean, I was like just yelling and screaming and like, you know, and you could just see, I mean, there's no excuse for that. Right. But I, I was overweight I was tired easily. I had uncontrolled stress. You know, then you kind of feel sorry for yourself. And, you know, it's just one of those things that, yes, like sleep apnea really is that, like, you know, monster that crawls into every aspect of your life. You know, I, I have to be a father figure. I have to control my stress. And those things are absolutely critical and important for me to... Um, I'm sorry. Okay. So I did say to myself, how can I go on like this? How can I raise my children like this? You know, and again, earlier I said, you know, I'm, I'm a son, I'm a, I'm, I'm a father and I'm also a husband. So how can I be the best that I can be for them? But it's connected to my patients. How can I be the best for my patients if I'm having all this going on? You know, so, so these are really important things I think that are, are um, important to mention. So, you know, I've been actually for, you know, especially people at Microdental who've known me for years, I've been kind of overweight uh, for a lot of my life. But definitely as a kid, I was a chubby kid. I was always last to be picked uh, in PE for sports and stuff. And believe me, I tried every diet known to man. I mean, and kind of combinations. And so it was just, you know, I, maybe I would lose a little bit. I would gain them back. And so that was going on while also exercising. Uh, I would try the P90X. I would try uh, going and, and just nothing seem to work right and so when you think about those things that are connected well your uh, leptin hormones your ghrelin hormones your appetite craving I was a stress eater you know every time when I had to do a really big case and the patient had a gag reflex I mean you can imagine you know how I handled it was I ate and even you know and I felt like I was hungry and whatnot but if I'm not getting good sleep the ghrelin and leptin hormones those are infected right so those are affected so you can see that yes, um, everything that I was trying really wasn't working and it became sort of this, disappointment after disappointment. And now when you think about just America as a whole with the COVID and the stress that we all go through, the unpredictable, and this is just another thing. If you have sleep apnea, it's just gonna make things even more difficult. Energy levels, hunger sensation, all those things are all tied to that. So it's very, very important that when we're thinking about this as dentists, the, the, you know, like myself, these are real human life journey um, moments here that are very serious and related to our lifespan and our quality of life. 
So one day, of course, thank God, I thank God that I have a aha moment. Then I said, huh, airway, there's all this uh, dental sleep medicine stuff going on. What's that all about, right? So that really started um, uh, giving me this notion where I found the trifecta. The trifecta is three things. You can't have two and make it work. So remember earlier I said I tried exercising and but see I never addressed my sleep, right? Or let's say if I did address my sleep but I never ate right or I ate like McDonald's all the time or I never exercised. You need this trifecta, all three in place. This is good quality sound sleep as adults seven and a half to eight hours per night, seven nights a week right? Good exercise and good nutrition. And I love the fact that now we're talking about all those uh, food industry issues and big pharma and, you know, synthetic stuff versus organic and eating healthy and eating right. Uh, absolutely very, very critical. So when you have that trifecta, magic happens. Okay. So I want to give a little bit of uh, a prior and then we can go over some of this. Oh, well, we will go over some of this later, but I had an Epworth sleepiness score. There's an Epworth sleepiness scale that we ask our sleep patients to fill out. And anything above 11 considered by medical insurance is definitely uh, important for reimbursement. So I was at a 16. So it asks questions, you know, how sleepy are you? How likely are you to doze off when, you know, you're at a lecture like this uh, at 2 p.m. after lunch? And sometimes most people are kind of tired. They may kind of doze off. Mal and Potty, the anesthesiologist, they use that. They look at just really stick your tongue all the way out, relax, and how much can you see down the airway? And when you're at three and four, again, that's another red flag, another sign that's kind of correlated and attached to that. Of course, uh, my brother and I both were CPAP intolerant for many, many reasons. My brother actually would pull out the CPAP in the middle of the night and didn't even know he did it. Um, but there's a whole slew, a whole array of things from uh, people who have aerophasia or the noise or supportability or the whole, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So we'll, we'll kind of get into that a little bit as well. And then I did a, a pharyngometer collapse and we'll go over that a little bit too as well. And I checked my uh, airway and how lack of patency or lack of pat patent it is due to uh, the fact that uh, first I was overweight um, and I didn't have oral appliance therapy and have any of that. So it was less than 1.0 centimeter squared. Dr. Atul Mahatra from Harvard did a study on that and said that when you are at that level at 1.0 below, you are 35 times more likely to suffer from all the comorbidities associated with sleep apnea. So I'm thinking, okay, that totally makes sense because you look at those uh, slides of me being way overweight, perspiring, hypertension uncontrolled, um, uh, having acid reflux, all those things, right? Those things are very much, you know, shortening my life and, and really killing me slowly and slowly, right? So I wrote down hello <laughs> at the very bottom of that. So um, thank goodness I'm a dentist. Thank goodness um, I have an open mind. Thank goodness that there is dental sleep medicine, such a thing as that. So oral appliance, okay, which is cr crazy because doing that gave me more energy. So when I talked about sports and stuff like that, compared to how I worked out prior to nowadays, or even when I was uh, treating myself, night and day difference. I took karate, and I'll show some photos of what happened to me after karate. Um, and at the same time, I was like, wow, well, you know what? I feel better. I have more energy, and I'm going to eat better. And that's just sort of like a cascade of things that you'll find. It just, things just kind of open up. And I'm just telling you, it's night and day. I don't take any forms of caffeine. I don't drink coffee or tea. I just don't like the taste. And my employees, my team says, thank God you don't because you're already so energetic nowadays. Um, so yes, you don't need coffee, Dr. Who, you don't need any of that because I think you'd go crazy. Um, but anyways, um, there's also things like um, Dr. Singh mentioned uh, fermented foods, kimchi, sarko. Every um, uh, society has a form of fermented foods and actually those are good for the flora and for the GI. And so there are studies and things that go in that, but I just want to throw that in there as an extra bonus thing to talk about. So this is where I was. I was, you know, prior at Legoland, I was wearing pants size 46, right? So you can see on the left, and I was me holding little Walter. Um, he's much taller and bigger now. Years have gone by. And I went down to a size 32. That's 14 inches. Yes, um, I do have a cousin who uh, does... Um, 
ink and tattoo, so I also got a little bit of that added on. But so I traded my weight for the tattoos. Let's just put it that way. So anyhow, um, but that is uh, where I'm at, and I can tell you what a major difference, right? The community, um, they just people are saying, "Wow, did you see Dr. Who lately?" You know, sometimes people say, "Oh, he's kind of like the Rock. He's really buff." So I'm like, "Yes, thank you." Uh, but anyhow, really a major changer for me. I mean, I'm thinking now the dad I want to be, all those things, right? The the good son, the good husband, all of that. That's my life. So how can I as a dentist, you know, not try to share this uh, important uh, transformation? Uh, I think this is a couple of months ago, no, actually several months ago. And uh, my wife, Sharon, and I, we were thinking, you know, could we both fit in what I, my clothes that I used to wear? But really, I've, uh, you can see what a, you know, dramatic weight loss that was. But it really is that trifecta, the nutrition, the exercise, and then the or the sleep. So yeah, I got my black belt uh, in uh, Jin and Ryu karate. It's Okinawan karate. But I have to tell you, like those endurance tests, I mean, it was the sensei spitting at my face saying, do you want that black belt? Do you want that black belt? And you know, it's like, I'm like <gasps> doing like, you know, ninja crunches and then doing like burpees. And I'm like, oh, and he's like, you know, spitting. And I'm like, there is no way, no way if I didn't lose weight, if I didn't have good quality sleep, right? The energy and everything that comes from it to be able to get my black belt. As a matter of fact, see, when you get your black belt, that's the one that the sensei actually ties the belt on you. Um, all the other belts you tie on yourself, all the other color, colored belts. So in the black belt, when that happened, oh my God, I started bawling. I'm thinking all my life, I've been this kind of chubby kid, this chubby adult and hypertension. And when he was doing that, I just lost it. I just started crying. So anyways, this is kind of, again, the impact and the life uh, uh, changes that comes from addressing uh, sleep. Oh, I'm sorry. So we took, you know, I know there's controversy, you know, and I agree, yes, because you can position yourself different. But if you just look at the overall volume of my airway on CT scans, um, you know, some uh, um, naysayers says, well, you don't use them for airway. No, I get it. Yes, you can move your jaw in positions and that would affect that. But um, I tried to get before and afters um, as close as possible. And you can see that really I've doubled my airway, losing weight and, uh, you know, identifying dent uh, dental seat medicine issues, all that inflammation, all that soft tissue, everything just, you know, healing. And it's just, it's amazing. As a matter of fact, on the pharyngometer, which is really, you know, fantastic. It just gives you, it's a sonar rendering of a cross section of your airway. And when I did the Mueller's collapse, I literally didn't collapse anymore. I mean, I had a pain airway. So we talk about airflow and fluid dynamics, the P-crit. After I blew all the air out, I was able to still sustain. So this is my pharyngeal walls, everything like that was able to sustain that airway so that is another like that on top of ct scan on top of the way i look and now we look at the difference right we look at before wow uh, mission of mercy I barely did anything and I got a full uh, forehead full of sweat and perspiration. And now it takes a freaking 10 mile bike ride and everything to, to you know, so th this is just really impactful. And I'm so, you know, happy to be able to share this with you guys. And also for the first time in my, in my life, literally my blood panel came back, everything was normal. I mean, I'm talking about triglycerides, I'm talking about everything. I've never had that in my life, right? So it's such a really, I mean, I'm a testament. So when I share this with my patients, they, you know, they're like, wow, I want this. And so as a dentist and as a educator, it's responsible, my responsibility to share this. It's, this is why I'm so passionate about it, because if this can happen to me, I feel like it's a calling for me to share this with as many dentists as possible to get them uh, doing dental sleep medicine. So after over 100 pounds off, so my RDI uh, resp uh, d disturbance index, uh, so that's uh, all the AHI plus the rear res, it was like 32 of that prior slide. Now it went down under five. So that means really no longer sleep apnea, which is like, you know, pretty cool. But I was able to not take those prescription medications anymore. So, wow, you can think about how Big Pharma has such a control and toll over our society. And that, you know, we have a narcotics issue, we have all those things, and you can just see that these synthetic things kind of have all these side effects. We listen to commercials all the time. You can take this, take this, take that. And I remember as a child, it was very, very hard to ever see like really new medications on commercial. Nowadays, if you have like an itch on your bottom, there's a cream for it or something, but then there's like a list of 10,000 side effects that you have to be aware of, right? So it's very, very important that 
we know that if we can wean patients off of their medications, you know, you're seeing that and you're thinking, hmm, well, maybe if there is an airway issue and if there is things that we can do to encourage that, tie in a little bit of nutrition, tie in a little bit of exercise, and the patient, and believe me, it's connected to your dentistry as well, which will show that is a very, very important takeaway message that all of it, and you as a dentist can be such a champion, really, for the health of your patients. And, and so this is really um, something that I wanted to, to, to say. So when you respect airway, I found the sky's the limit because really you, you make lives change. Um, you know, we always in the past, when I did a lot of big cosmetic cases, we talk about we change lives, but now we save lives, we extend lives. And so really it's powerful in the, the sky's the limit. So I always, I, I did a, a, a lecture one year at the J-Bear as well as in the Hawaii, the military, um, uh, um, uh, places uh, in Alaska and Hawaii. Anyways, I've always liked Top Gun as a, so I took the music out of this one, but there was music in the background um, and I wanted to be the Asian Top Gun guy. So, hey, look, you know, that's another little, anyways, uh, aside from that. So, you know, again, I just can't, you know, really uh, reiterate more, uh, underscore more that, you know, maybe you as a dentist, there is a calling, you know, there are over 1 billion people in the world who are underdiagnosed, undertreated with this, right? And you can see um, some are, are even like um, uh, women who have upper airway resistance syndrome and they get a good sleep test, but they're having all these micro arousals. They get fibromyalgia and they're tired all the time. So we as dentists, we are we're so much empowered that we can do to change life drastically. So a lot of the stuff that I say is not just, you know, I pull it out from nowhere. I have journals, I have literature and stuff. So, you know, just, just know that this is all recorded, but there's things uh, that are useful for you in case you need to talk to uh, interdisciplinary uh, doctors, uh, physicians and whatnot. One thing that's very responsible though, that I think though uh, that everyone should, this is just in my humble opinion, um, we all can agree on continued education. You're here because of that. You're care, you care about uh, furthering your, your education and doing all that's very important. Another thing is I really believe in measurements. Now, this is the part that maybe, you know, in terms of, especially if you're a fresh graduate or out of dental school, uh, some of the instrumentation, whether you're talking about the Echovision pharyngometer, rhinometer, or you're talking about, um, uh, the uh, myotronics, the K7, if you're doing neuromuscular in conjunction with airway, or even a comb beam, yes, it's not pocket change, I totally understand. But when you can measure things and when you can look at outcomes you can have before, all that is really, really good stuff. And also it's very important as much as possible. You know, I had to get out of my comfort zone and really just go to the ENT. I went to Anchorage uh, Ascent, they're the biggest ENT uh, group uh, at Providence Hospital. I gave presentations and, you know, get out of your comfort zone and talk to them, talk to Atlas Orthogonus, uh, chiroductic peoples, uh, uh, sacral, occipital, SOTs, all these people that you could work with really for airway to again have the ultimate outcome for a whole quality of life change for your patient. And here's just some of that. I'm just this. This is the echo vision, and this is myotronics, the uh, neuromuscular stuff. Just having a comb beam. I have two comb beams. I have two locations. One is sold out, and the one in Anchorage. I have the, the the mother comb beam V17. But if you're doing growth guidance appliances and stuff like that, just be aware having a V17 is very very critical, especially if you're trying to get diagnostics from the Facial Beauty Institute or from the Vivos camp. They really want a full uh, field of view, so you, that's something to consider. But again, I know it's not pocket change. Um, I believe in digital scanners, digital dentistry. It's so accurate. You know, there's studies that show when you take PBS impressions and things like that, especially like in Alaska, when it could be like 20, 30 below, and that impression is going to go into the FedEx truck, right? And then it's going to go to California. And then when it gets to California, it may be sunny, 75, 80 degree. Um, yeah, that impression may distort a little bit. So that's just something when you're doing digital, you have no uh, worries whatsoever with that. And so when we do these beautiful cases, and I, I, they, I'm so honored to be like with Mark Dental all these years, and you, they create incredible songs. They say, no, it's Dr. Who. I say, they, they say, it's you, Dr. Who. I say, no, 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 it's you. Actually, really, Max Studio, uh, the, the work that you guys do are just incredible. It is life-changing. You can see um, some, some of them are in the Alaska Airlines magazine. And uh, I've used them on TV commercials and things like that. It's just really life-changing. But I have to say to myself, all these beautiful smiles and this wonderful uh, Chris over there at Microdental, I know spends a lot of time, details, planning, the smile design and all that stuff. So what if one of these people, 
you know, you can't judge a book by its cover, especially in airway, but one of, one of these has severe sleep apnea. What if they have severe bruxism? What if they, all these things that I've talked about? Um, hello, we spent so much time planning these beautiful smiles with these cases. We need to think ahead. We need to think about long-term success, long-term, um, um, and I'll show slides as we go on about that. And again, uh, some more um, um, uh, references there about airway and about how that's connected to dentistry. And uh, then I'll show some x-rays uh, in a few. Again, for implant cases, right? We know that implants need to be loaded on the long axis of the tooth, right? But imagine if you're sleeping kind of half supine, half to your left, or even prone, and you're on your bed. Remember in REM, all your muscles go paralyzed, right? So gravity becomes your biggest enemy. And at that time, I've, I spent all this time with the, the soft tissue, the bone augmentation, all this stuff. We have a beautiful case. And you can see that this was not an easy case, right? And spent so much time getting everything done. And oh my goodness, um, if you're sleeping in that way and you have sleep apnea and your airway closes and you desaturate in oxygen and your brain says, uh, if I don't move that jaw or that tongue out of the way, I'm going to die, right? And so if that occurs at that time and you're thinking, oh, you know, when I check my occlusion, the patient's awake, we're sitting them up. Uh-uh, they're not like this, you know, in the middle of the bed, but they're trying to fight for their life. So all occlusion, the contacts, the things that you look at, it goes out the window because at night, who knows what's going on? I mean, if they're like lacking and gasping for air and they're doing all sorts of whatever maneuvers to just stay open to keep a pain airway, all of this is at risk. So when I was at ICOI, AID, I was talking about this because I'm sorry, but you're not going to only get the long axis of uh, forces. You're going to get sheer pitch, roll, yaw, anterior, posterior, lateral, whatever it is, depending on what position, the whole nine yards. Okay, so keep that in mind. So here is a case that I did years and years. So this is a very, very good, and I love that I was able to pull the x-ray out for this, right? So this patient came to me. This is before I did any airway. I was just like, you know, like during the Legoland times, whatnot, uh, give or take. And this patient already is screaming airway issues. There's ab fractions. There's teeth fractured left and right. There's a root. She's on the right side, like number four or five, four or five. That's like a fractured tooth. On the left, there's another root tip. So what? I'm going to go ahead and put implants in there. And all of a sudden, these forces, these airway issues are just going to magically go away. No, I don't think so. So this is what happened. This patient came in. And so we, you know, I was also going through the ICOI, AID uh, accreditation, stuff like that. We're implants in there and this uh, was I think it was a Nobel implant but it was also integrated after six months in function in function for over a year and a half and then this patient walks in with half the implant and a bone in her hand with a little bit of blood in it I'm freaking out I'm thinking you're kidding me right if I gave you a titanium implant and I asked you to use your fingers to try to break it, right? Uh, excuse me, I'll give you a decade. There's no way you can break that. A literally titanium implant with bone, right? So there's that much force going on. But you have to say to yourself, well, you know, Jerry, Dr. Who, like, wasn't that already like there? If you looked at her presentation pre-op, right? It's already screaming, uh, hello, I have some kind of bruxism airway issues, right? I'll tell you this for sure. And I'm going to give you some literature. But when I uh, did my um, uh, credentialing for... ABOI and stuff like that. I had to go to a sleep center and I had to work with uh, uh, sleep technicians, uh, registered certified sleep technicians, and look at polysomnogram activity. I'm going to tell you that every time when I see a long duration of an apnea or a hypopnea or an apnea hypopnea mix long time, you'll see effort. You'll see effort that the body is trying to fight for a patent airway. And in children, you guys see it all the time, you hear them, they'll gnash their teeth, they'll brux and stuff like that. Absolutely airway tied and airway related. So very, very important here to think about that. So if a person comes in here like this and they're overclosed, they have toroid up the wazoo, there's not enough room for their tongue, you have bicuspid drop-off, you have all these signs pointing like, oh my goodness, and they've already worn down everything to dentin, right? Um, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and what, do full mouth reconstruction, I'm going to go ahead and do implants or, you know, let's extract that baby tooth on the lower left uh, and not think about airway. No, 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 It's very, very important. We need to look beyond the teeth, look at how all that quality time that the lab spent to make that beautiful smile, that you spent to talk to patient for smile design, to, to look at the bone graft, the healing of the bone graft, the implant, the osteointegration of the implant, 
on and on and on. It's very, very important that we take the time and the effort to think beyond and protect uh, our beautiful, the patient's investment in your beautiful work and quality uh, work with the lab. So of course, Microdental has their array of uh, different, uh, this is again why I love Microdental in the sense that it's kind of all in one. Um, so if you're going to do a big case, plan ahead, you know, especially if they're going to drop a lot of money for a small makeover or a big implant case all on four or any type of overditch retained with implants. Um, they aren't cheap uh, treatment plan items, right? So look at the different array. Um, now, of course, be cognizant that if you are doing Medicare patients, um, there there's a Herbst or a TAP requirement. You can see that Respire, they all have this uh, av availability to have that uh, component uh, with that, but make sure you design and I believe Teresa with the lab can help you with details. I know the Respire Pink is wonderful in the sense that it could have a metal legal apron. It could be minimalistic. So it's, it's, it's more room for the tongue. It, it's less invasive for the tongue. And those pearls like that. And the Moses has those wonderful uh, exercises that they do, those uh, um, uh, kinetic dynamics to see really how your body uh, responds in different positions to take the Moses bite and whatnot. There's a whole array. I, of course, really love the pharyngometer bite because, again, I love instrumentation and measurements. But, for example, if you do do the pharyngometer bite, all of these appliances can be made to the pharyngometer bite. So anyhow, that's just an aside, but I want you to know that yes, you're here for the right reasons because you're working with a lab that understands not just the big uh, important implant slash cosmetic dentistry stuff, but you also have the array, uh, a menu of selection of items um, that they offer. So if we're looking at that, there's also other options because sometimes oral appliances, there are quote unquote non-responders. Um, and so definitely when you look at what's in the literature, what's out there with the most evidence-based is of course the, those appliances that we just shown, but there's all active things that you can do. So those are called static treatment in dental sink medicine. So when you have a bite position that you validated, that you found is good for the airway and holds the airway patent, those are static. The stuff on number two below, they're more dynamic. So when you think about Vivos, the craniofacial epigenetic pneumopedic modality, or the osseo growth guidance appliance, the AGGA, RAGGA, or the Myobrace Healthy Starts for Kids, Orthotane, Homeoblab, Chirodontics, all those stuff were actually either growing the airway, we're making a dynamic change. And of course, there's a whole slew of things to go on with that. Um, as well as if you do a little bit more invasive, whether the uh, surgical assisted rapid palate expansion or with the mi mini implants, micro implants, MSC with one moon, excellent. I will tell you that if you're in the orthodontic world, they're very, very into the MSC one moon style where they split the palatal suture. And obviously by doing so, you're gonna increase um, the airway uh, right away. You're gonna have really like killer results on the AHI and stuff like that if you take pre and post. And the orthodontics, you know, because the, uh, Dr. Moon is also orth orthodontic at UCLA, a lot of um, uh, support for that. Um, and then, um, you know, in pediatrics, there's also things like the uh, Hyrax and Palo expanders and things like that. But um, this is not more so on pediatrics. I have other pediatric seminars. If you guys are interested for Michael Dental to do a pediatric seminar sometime down the road, I'd be more than happy to. And of course, um, outside of the U.S., um, there is a lot of surgery and I'm kind of non-invasive in my approach. I'd rather, because once you have surgery, it's irreversible, number one. Number two, um, there's a side effect or something that goes on and they're not cheap either. They're all, you know, pretty expensive, including Inspire. But when I was over lecturing in Hong Kong and Asia and Malaysia, a lot of the oral surgeons did MMA. It's maxillary mandibular advancement. Um, and it does have a 95% success rate, but it's major surgery. And so most patients are going to probably go, eh, can we please try a non-invasive uh, manner for, for my airway issues? Uh, here's some examples of when you think about expansion. This is actually just a Vivo slide uh, that can tell you how you look at the palate, the occlusal shot, <clears throat> how, how much expansion, how much airway volume you can do from, from doing um, that type of uh, treatment. So I'm kind of go now shifting to introduction, some of uh, sleep medicine stuff. Um, we'll have some videos and things like that to kind of make it blend in. Hopefully everyone's still paying attention and keeping along with me. You can see I'm still passionate, even though I'm losing my voice. Um, so, but anyhow, again, I want to highlight that there is about 1 billion people, right? Um, 
<clears throat> who are underdiagnosed, undertreated. And given what I have, my own personal journey and everything that I've already uh, kind of detailed, uh, you can see this is very, very important. This really affects everyone uh, from the bed partner uh, to grandma, grandpa. You know, earlier you saw how much, uh, how many years, some say it's 15 and 22 years of a lifespan you can take away. So, wow, when you're that grandparent that wants to be at your grandkids' uh, graduation or you want to be at your kid's wedding or whatnot, yes, those 15 to 22 years, you better bet, is very, very important. So if we can make that lifespan expand for our patients, oh, my goodness, you know, what an amazing thing that we can do as dentists, right? So this is the exercise I do when I give a live seminar. So I pretty much, I'll just go over all of it. I said, raise your hand down the room if you have any of these. And by the time I'm with through the last questions, everyone in the room has their, their hand uh, raised up. So what it tells me is, is this really is having risks, red flags uh, for sleep breathing disorders and uh, sleep apnea. Generally, I'm, I'm not kidding. Every conference I go to, <laughs> you'll have everyone in the room pretty much with their hands raised. So you can see that, yes, when patients come in, one statistic that's very important to keep in mind is they found that in an average dental practice in America, you will have about 400 patients that walk through your practice with sleep breathing issues from UARS to uh, sleep apnea. So if you're not following the ADA guidelines and screening them and, you know, getting involved in adult sleep medicine, it's really kind of um, sad. It's, I don't know what the word is, disappointing, whatever it is, but not only can you make a difference in their lives, but it really helped differentiate your practice. So there's some more uh, prevalence and statistic issues. You know, again, there's a, a lot of, of, of uh, issues where if we don't take charge of what the American Dental Association says, we're going to have a big problem because that one billion number is not going to get smaller. Um, it's, you know, with more and more people. And I, I, it's just, it's a tragedy if we don't do something. And yes, let's, let's be proud of ourselves, dentists. We have the ability to really probably do more. I'm going to be very honest and I'll try to be as positive as possible, but I'm telling you when I do a two day seminar, a lot of the dentists, I mean, I would just say a lot, all of the dentists have more training and more on sleep than a lot of primary care physicians and medical doctors, including through residency, because it's acted, I was given as a elective two and a half hour class that a lot of people don't take when they go through medical school. So just by having a two-day seminar, you know more knowledge. And seriously, you know, I want to give the story about my, my mom. So my mom recently had to uh, uh, get hemodialysis because both of her kidneys failed. And I want to say, um, I'm sharing this again because I'm, I, this is what my passion again. All these years, she had uh, hypertension, right? And snoring and all these. So, so yes, I do have an oral plans for her. Yes, everything like that. But you can imagine, this is decades of uh, being um, hypertension medication resistant, right? So they keep adding, 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 right? And I remember even one of the medications, she started growing like all this weird side effect hair stuff. And, and I remember her waiting um, maybe about a couple of hours, really, because, you know, the internal medicine place here is really busy. And then after waiting a couple of hours, the nurse got her, weighed her. And then she waited another 20 minutes or so before the doctor came in. And she says, well, I have an allergy to one of my hypertension medications. And he said, um, oh, well, here's another medication. Okay, bye. And then she checks out. and There's another $300 appointment. I'm thinking, you know, oh my gosh, wow. That's like, what, two seconds of the medical doctor's time. And that was another $300. And it was a side effect for a multiple medication. And this entire time, not one doctor, not one physician, not anybody asked her, hey, by the way, do you snore at night? Do you gasp for air at night? Do you wake up tired? Any of those questions that we now know, oh my gosh, right? All the comorbidities, everything associated with that. So I'm just really telling you, I, I'm getting goosebumps right now because you're here right now. You're a dentist and absolutely look in your heart. We have the ability to really make an impact and the statistics with oral appliance therapy is much, much significantly better uh, than CPAP. And I have slides that took went on that a little bit later as well, but I just wanted to hallmark that. Yes, medical school, uh, school training, it's elective. It's just one class, right? So you being here already, you're, you're getting a lot of education right now as we're speaking.
And so when you look at any type of graph or pie charts or whatever, you'll see really the people that are even diagnosed and the people that are really even treated well, that little blue pie piece, that's really it. So it's kind of, I want to say the word pathetic, but it's kind of pathetic. And now that we know how serious this is, this is really, really sad that we have this issue. So this is a, a couple of patients, um, you know, I'll see if the video plays, um, but it, it talks about their, their life-changing uh, moments. Let's see here if it'll play. My oral appliance, I have noticed that I can now breathe through my nose at night when I sleep. I don't snore anymore because my wife no longer leaves the bedroom. She stays with me. I feel refreshed when I get up in the morning. I do have more energy. Um, I found that it is a very comfortable. I have no problem from the first day I put it in. It really isn't hard to get used to. And it does what it's supposed to do. I breathe better. I sleep better. Life in general is better because of it. And, you know, I'll skip over the next one due to time, but they're just, you know, a lot of testimonials that show that people I, um, or, uh, really are going to rave about your practice because, you know, you're going beyond looking beyond the teeth. And this is uh, actually a very tragic slide. These are, I think, the, the Chad, he's a uh, R and B, or no, he's a rap artist. Uh, Justin, I think, is on the Deadliest Catch uh, in Alaska. <laughs> I'm in Alaska. And then Mike is a commercial truck driver, some kind of truck driver TLC program. Um, you can see they're, they're all overweight. They're in the mid-30s. Um, they have high BMI. Uh, the neck or circumference, if you have 17, in men or greater, 16 women, that's a red flag for airway issues. Um, and that's also important I want to bring out. So like, you know, if your hygienist starts getting the neck uh, uh, tape out and, you know, patients will say, what are you doing? And you're like, well, actually my doctor is really, you know, uh, lear learning about the LC medicine. We care for overall health. Those are good conversation starters. Those are good things. Your team is so valuable and important to really jump into dental C medicine and get these uh, conversations going. And it's just going to be a win-win because your patients can go, wow, you really look above and beyond uh, for um, my, my health, okay? So all of them were diagnosed with septic sleep apnea, but the thing is there none of us, none of them are with us. They all passed away from complications of their OSA. And you can see that it's everywhere. I mean, Justice Scalia, Carrie Fisher, you look at uh, even like uh, Captain Hazelwood for the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Like, yeah, that had sleep apnea related to, I mean, he was completely fragmented sleep. And look at how many of those poor little puffins and those sea otters. I mean, you think about that. So earlier I was talking about airline pilots landing in the wrong airport or people who work with heavy machinery. Hello. Hello, people, sleep apnea is real and it's very, very serious and it can affect other people um, in their lifespan. So if you think about sleep, I want to just, I love this slide because it kind of tells you what we're supposed to go through. We go through sleep architecture, right? We go through every night. There's these cycles where we go from N1, N2, N3 RAM. And think about children in the playground, right? So let's say the slide is the favorite thing they like to do. So every kid during recess wants to go on the uh, slide. So they get in line and they go up the ladder and then they go down the slide and they go all the way around and get back in line. So think of that like sleep. So what happens if they slide down halfway and all of a sudden they fall off? Well, sorry, you don't get to go back on where you fell off and then finish the slide. Sorry, you go back to the end of the line and you, you do that. And that's what happens when you have an arousal, when you have sleep apnea. You don't just continue your architecture and you're going through uh, the sleep pattern and stuff like that. Nope, you start all over again. And imagine you do that over and over, like someone with an AHI, like 100 and something. Oh my goodness, 100 per hour, you're starting over and over again. And that fragmented sleep can be very detrimental. This is where when you have oxygen desaturation levels, your body shifts from parasympathetic sympathetic to sympathetic. You have the whole uh, thing, array of things causing all this problem. And so it's very, very key and important like you realize, and some of you may have bed partners, husbands and wives that do this. You think about it over and over again. That's a huge toll on the body. You know, when you see a bear, like in Alaska, sure, if you have adrenaline, fight or flight, cortisol, yeah, get it on because you're surviving. But if you're lying in bed and you're having all these things going on, just so you can get a patent airway, excuse me, it's very, very serious. So if this is how bad it gets. I'm going to play some of this video. You can see um, this is a polysomnogram. So you'll be silent for some time. You can see the after problem. You'll see the abdomen trying to force. And this is where acid reflux can take place. Okay? So I'll just let you watch for a little bit. I'll stop this at the next time and go forward. 
So he's going to be real quiet. And you'll see, if you look at the abdomen and stomach area, you'll see this the upper belt. He's trying to push. He's trying to breathe, right? And by the way, he has no idea. He's like, you know, probably dreaming and thinking, you know, whatever. But his body is like near potentially heart attack or fatal consequence. Actually, if you see this video too long, you kind of get a really empty fit. Really kind of like, you just want to breathe for the patient. So it's just choking. I'm just going to stop it. So, okay, we're going to talk about obstructive. So this is just, uh, you guys are kind of know, you have obstructive sleep apnea is different than central sleep apnea. Obstructive is when you actually have a physical blockage. So when I was earlier alluding to the fact that if you're sleeping supine, you have the tongue, soft palate, epiglottis, all those tissues can, boom, collapse the air, right? Airway, excuse me. And then you're not going to have air going down. Then you're going to have oxygen saturation. And oftentimes, what do we do about it? We do about a CPAP, right? So we force air. And I want to say this is very, very important. If people can wear their CPAP seven nights a week at seven and a half to eight hours a night, great. But when you have the NIH, when you have all the studies that measure CPAP success and CPAP tolerance and whatnot, they judge it by literally 70% of the nights, you know, and at four hours or so. So imagine if you did a dental crown or if you did an implant and you said, patient, please just use that only four hours uh, uh, per day uh, or just five days a week. They'll look at you like, uh, what kind of dentist are you? I mean, you're telling me I can only use my crown for that few, you know, and this is a very serious medical condition. I mean, you know, if they lost the crown, yeah, that's bad news, but they're not going to die. They can literally die from sleep apnea. So this is very, very, very important. So here's a little funny thing. I will play this because this is funny. Is it my imagination or are we really starting to get the hang of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very terrific. For a while there, it was like we were in the zone, working together as one and anticipating each other's moves like the 05 White Sox. <laughs> So you can't come and take me out to the ball game? I had to, otherwise I'd have laid down a bunt before I left the dugout. <laughs> finish up a little bit of work for a while. Oh, by all means, go ahead. It's important that you feel at home here. You sure? Yeah, we just shared the most intimate thing two human beings can share. At this point, cracking open your laptop is almost redundant. <laughs> well, thank you. Good night. Good night. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Which, you know, as funny as it used to be, because I had this kid in my class, and it was... <laughs> Whoa. If this is a turnoff, I could do without it. No, no, I, I was a little startled, but it's fine. I know it looks a little strange, but it does keep me from snoring. Which is what makes it so hot. Please leave it on. Thank you, dope. You know, you can get different colored head straps. I went with basic black. Nice. Very slimming. <laughs> Good night, Molly. Good night, Mike. very serious um you affect the bed partner so earlier one of the things that was running on repeat it was yeah the bed partners loses hours of sleep as well so that's something very important to keep in mind so 
you know, here we are as dentists, then we can offer an alternative to that. Um, we're going to have um, evidence base at Boyd, and there's all sorts of literature that will be available to you guys to show that when you look at the mean disease alleviation, the SARA index, this is how long people are compliant and how much they're using an oral appliance compared to CPAP. We blow them out of the waters. I mean, we our statistics are so much better, um, sometimes 89 to 90% compliance even after five years. So we're looking at a whole different uh, opposite end of the spectrum type of thing when we look at oral appliance therapy. So remember this, um, efficacious, efficacy, yes. CPAP will blow air, force air down, so it's efficacious, yes. You'll get your AHI <coughs> to zero or one. But if you're not using it and you have very few hours, it's not effective. So long-term effectiveness, oral appliance is way better. This is actually came out in 2015. It is the medical doctor saying, here, we give you dentists. We are, yes, the board-certified sleep MDs are the only ones that can diagnose sleep apnea. Remember, that's very important. We cannot diagnose that. We can screen, but we cannot diagnose. But this is the green light that tells us, look, for mild to moderate, even first line, we can use oral appliance therapy as a choice for sleep apnea over severe. But don't get me wrong, there are plenty of studies going out showing that even for severe, it, it does wonder. So, but when you work with the sleep MD, when they do have severe, they always need to do a trial of CPAP. And if they were to fail the CPAP, listen, if they're failing CPAP, they're not using anything something already automatically has to be better than nothing, right? But moreover, if you can get them on oral appliance and stick to it long-term, oh my goodness, this is very, very impactful. We as dentists have the power to do that. And then so again, I really am happy that 2017 uh, American Dental Association, remember when they said, hey, you know, dentists, you need to do oral cancer screening. And we all listened, we all did that. I hope it has the same effect right now. We all as dentists, every one of us, I don't care for orthodontist, prosthodontist, uh, pediatric, whatever, please, please screen uh, for airway and tie it to uh, all of that. And then, so there is uh, earlier some controversy, but I'm going to show you slide after slide. There's so much literature now that talks about sleep bruxism and all those forces to fight for a pain in airway. It is treated now like a sleep related movement disorder, like uh, restless leg syndrome, periodic limb, PLMD, uh, uh, that, that type of disorder. So here's some um, information. I know we're running a little bit low on time, but Yes, this study again shows that sleep breathing disorders and everything with bruxism go hand in hand. Another one that shows uh, that uh, when you look at the sleep symptoms and things of OSA and you look at bruxism like I did at the sleep center, they go hand in hand. Um, this one uh, was a pilot study that talks about 77.8% uh, of them having EMG recordings. And that's what we see. We see the EMGs at the polysomnogram spike up and that's muscle like the masters, everything trying to fight for a pain airway, another um, article available there. And then uh, this is uh, also talking about aft fractions, right? Oftentimes when you look at aft fractions, okay, so if someone's really brushing their teeth that hard, wouldn't the gum tissue be thrashed? How is it just so perfect? I mean, I've seen all these photos. Even if you just Google aft fractions, you see these perfectly knotted at the CEJ down to the root. No, that's from freaking forces. That's from like, you know, bruxing, trying to have a pain airway. And if you have an implant that you're supposed to have a long axis of the tooth forces, remember that I was alluding to earlier, uh, this is a very serious concern. It's something to be very important about. This is one of my favorite studies, okay? I just want to read almost like word for it. This is a 10,000 implant case study. This is huge, right? So definitely read, read, read report. And it says, bruxism is statistically significant risk factor of dental implant failure. So when I was at the ICOI and the AID um, meeting, they were showing that year, um, oh, look at implant statistics. It wasn't like how we thought they were going to be. They're not like 98.9% .9 all successful. We think about peri-implantitis and we think about um, uh, perimucositis and things like that where cement left under and inflammation and all that stuff. And I'm like, well, what about forces? What about sleep? And I knew one um, a doctor raised her hand asked and then the, the, the podium speaker said, well, just throw in a night guard. And I'm like, ah, so we're going to talk about that, the night guard issue. You, night guards, some of them actually can worsen the airway. So unless you have a proven validated therapeutic position that's held, 
with a pre and post sleep test, right, you can't just throw in a flat plane guard because they'll just take up room of the airway and sometimes it can actually exacerbate or worsen airway issues. So that would be an atrogenic problem. So remember that, okay? So definitely understand that sleep bruxism and airway and all these things when you connect it to cardiovascular, again, the body is shifting to sympathetic, trying to fight for a patent airway. Okay. And so when we talk about like uh, CPR, ABC, we, we need to do this. So all these um, uh, different uh, statistics and, and references, please uh, really look at all these uh, things when we're especially big implant cases, um, not just look about the bone quality density, just not look at uh, planning a, a surgical stent and looking at all the anatomy and stuff like that. Think about airway because once that implant and that, like that one lady I showed you with her uh, fixture fractured in half, think that that may happen. So I'm not going to go over that. That's just a bunch of references. But this is all available again. So here again about night guards and stuff. The American College of Prosthodontists, they did a, a, a evaluation of this. And their position is just don't do them um, unless you really have uh, everything about it the airway because they actually can just take up room and take up space without holding the jaw in the position that you know is qualified to keep the airway patent. So keep that in mind. And so, you know, the, the, the thing that's sad, again, here's some more statistics, is that CPAP's been around for a while. Sullivan back in Australia, I mean, just inverted a vacuum cleaner, and there you go, air blows in. But the problem is, is you look at all these years, 80s, 90s, 2000, and 2010s, and you don't, you don't see really much dent in the statistics of untreated sleep apnea, because first, you have poor compliance. And number two, it's, it's just a big joke that, you know, when you expect someone to wear three or four days or three or four nights, excuse me, per week, at, you know, 70% of the time, it's just, it's not, it's a low bar thing that I think we should uh, very much uh, be aware of. So, Again, this is regarding implant dentistry, all the stuff and the information that you put in, long-term success. Earlier I showed this, but there's other issues. Uh, you can see some of these are actually, you know, when we um, ask the lab to make them, please make them out of the occlusion. So, yeah, you put bite paper in and it's free, but I'm sorry during the middle of the night if you're, like, sleeping prone and you're in that weird pillow position and you're choking, gasping for air, you can imagine what the body, and you're sleeping, you're not aware. So you can see things like that. You can see the deterioration. You can see how that um, implant is uh, starting to fail, right? And you can see uh, this patient came and she had an overdenture. She got it done in Arizona, uh, I guess, a uh, year and a half or two uh, years ago. And then all of a sudden this happened. It's the same exact situation, right? And then and she always says, yeah, my husband tells me that I snore and stuff like that and I grind. And I didn't know. And I'm like, um, wow, you really have this major bruxism, um, gnashing, grinding and things. That's what her husband tells her that she does. But yeah, again, airways, very important. So when you put a beautiful porcelain, when I put those cases in, think about the microdental line of appliances and things like that. Again, think about equipment. Um, this is just, I, I don't need to go through that. If you guys go to either a sleep group solution seminar or even just Google or ask me, I can be more than happy to share with you what the pharyngometer does and how we find a bite. But all of these uh, different uh, uh, bites, they're all accepted by microdental. You can do them and uh, they'll make the appliance to that start position. And then, of course, I always uh, talk about morning AM aligners. I use my trios, and I capture a, a CO habitual position, and I ask my patients. It's also backed by the American Academy of Dulcet Medicine that this gets made. It's just an aligner to give them a reminder. Sometimes, you know, I just eat breakfast myself. I, you know, I wear my appliance, and I don't have to always use the AM aligner, but it is something really good to have there. And I just instruct, you know, maybe 10 minutes in the shower or even five minutes in the shower, just put it in. It has the appropriate perceptive guide to get you in and get your bite back um, and those are important things. Um so those side effects, like uh, like the AADS, they put out a statement saying that please do a morning uh, uh, occlusal guide or AM aligner. Um, also, the uh, Respire line, I was told, of course, could have compliance chips. There's the Braybon Denatrack chip. There's also the Theramon chip. So you can actually uh, gauge compliance. Uh, it's really cool. It's a, a thermal related, um, but they are very precise and let you know how long um, they have uh, in terms of, 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 of uh, compliance. So. Um, this is a video I'm going to skip because we're really uh, getting low on time, but it talks about sleep apnea and it's a video that since this is recorded, um, if you need a link to, we can play that. But it, it, it's a good thing though, to have these videos, if you're interested in getting to dental sleep medicine, because you can actually play them in your waiting room, or if you have some, kind of like a dental sleep medicine room or a concierge room. And, um, you know, because sometimes, especially, you know, in Alaska, we have those big slope workers. They're like, you know, I'm only here because my wife tells me to come here. I don't even think I snore 
are or they're embarrassed about it or they're in denial, you may want to have just like a separate room or a, an office and you can play these videos. You can go over these uh, uh, different uh, reasons and rationale as to why. So I'll skip that. On that Sleep. Slide. So this is a very neat uh, and interesting thing. So if every lab in the world, if every uh, home sleep test was done 100% and, uh, 100 of the time, 365 days a year, it would take 50 years right now just to diagnose all the people who have undertreated sleep apnea. So I want to say this, and this is why, again, I'm here today being full of passion. There's just not enough of us. We really, really need to take seriousness. I mean, the American Dental Association already said, look, we want every dentist to screen and look into airway. There's just way too many people who have this. And now that it's kind of tied to COVID, now it's tied to the pandemic, to all these things that we can make a difference, especially long-term survival rates. This is wow, right? I feel, again, a little bit goosebump because we, you know, seize the moment, take the time right now. Um, um, you know, and it's, you think of aerosols and all those things, put it all in your mind. Dental sleep medicine is such a, a thing. Uh, you know, this here's that statistic by four hours a night, 70 nights, 70 percent of the nights. Again, you know, we're looking at much better uh, uh, results with oral appliance therapy. And so um, you're looking at all these uh, different uh, things that you need six. So if you look at the prior slides, you're looking at four hours. Right. But all of this is saying, look, if you want memory performance, uh, reduction of cardiovascular risk and these things like that. Yeah, you need six hours or more. So, um, again, the effective new goal center should be the AHI that we talked about earlier, the apnea load, the SARA index, and the mean disease alleviation, because this is what long-term is and what's important for effective treatment. And so, yeah, if you look at this, um, in 2018, this is very, very sad. Um, I think there were over 2 million uh, people who were CPAP intolerant or something like that. Very, very high number, but only 200,000 oral appliances were made the entire year. So something is wrong with the picture, right? You have that many people who already failed CPAP. Um, so the stats on this one is a little bit prior. So I think in 2018 it was 2 million. It's even worse, right? So what I'm trying to say is, look, we need to really put oral appliance therapy on the map because if they're failing CPAP, they're doing nothing. And we've already identified all the comorbidities and everything's associated with that. The seriousness, life-changing things that we can talk about. This is very, very critical. Now we have all the reasons. It's tied to our dentistry. It's the overall quality of life. It's their everything, their immune system, the whole nine yards. Very, very important. So we're looking at, um, you know, and CPAP is a, what, $6 billion annual industry. It's like billions and billions with a B. So, you know, just like big pharma, I mean, just, just saying, you know, we need to really work together, unify as dentists to really, really look into airway and, and, and seeing that, um, uh, that it's very important and we can make a difference as dentists. So um, another thing about uh, healthcare, right? So if you think about, uh, we have a healthcare crisis in America. We talk about Medicare, we talk about Medicaid, and it's on average, this is with when sleep apnea is addressed, you're looking at the average uh, cost per person at 6000 excuse me, not address is at $6,366. And if you do address it, it's a third, it's $2,105. So just think of it on a whole uh, bigger, you know, take a step back, a whole national picture of our healthcare crisis. And you look at how sleep apnea, when it's unaddressed, the total cost will be 149.6 billion versus if it is addressed, look how much that lowers. So that's already a big thing on a national, whether you're political or not political, this is something that people should, should to look at as big numbers. And so, yes, and then when you figure that out, of course you say well, you have two to 3% success at all these billions of dollars. This five billion is an older number. It is more like six to $7 billion a year uh, for the CPAP uh, industry. So it's kind of really a shame. And when they're not using it, then it's when you get cases like Justice Scalia and all these other people who passed away. So it's very, very uh, serious and important. That, uh, Another study that uh, are coming out that's showing that overall, when you look at effective scores and you're looking at uh, oral appliance therapy for even diastolic uh, issues and all of that, you're looking at CPAP really um, effective wise, not even anything compared to oral appliance therapy. So I'm really proud that as dentists, we can make a big difference. And generally when you show 
and patients, do you want that or the other? Most of them are going to say, yes, I think I'm going to be more uh, compliant with an oral appliance. If I go fishing, if I go hunting, or if I'm in the military, I'm deployed, well, yeah, it's probably going to be better that they're defending our freedom and whatnot, that they have an oral appliance if they have sleep apnea, especially if they're like, you know, going to be in harm's way and they're, you know, helicopters, tanks and things like that. Hello, uh, having a- adequate sleep is so essential, right? So um, when you look at the different studies, they all would say that they prefer crossover studies, prospective studies, uh, any scientific study, they'll say, yes, the oral appliance is much preferred by the patient. And then also you see that the outside of the US and Canada, you will see that the first line of treatment period across all the spectrum, especially in Europe, when you look at Sweden, 52% at the time, they, they have many more oral appliances made there by far than the CPAP gold-plated standard countries such as USA uh, and, and uh, Germany and things like that. So some of the Scandinavian countries, is what I meant to say, uh, have very, very good uh, oral appliance therapy results, long-term effectiveness, and things like that. So. Um, again, this is just review about flat plane splints. So don't just always think that when people have uh, even snore guards. See? So snore guards, uh, they may be good at removing the snore, but if they're not treating underlying sleep apnea, it could be very dangerous. So having sleep tests and evaluating them, working with uh, certified sleep uh, physicians, as well as just the primary care physicians on that is very important. Don't just slap a, a, a flat plane splint or a snore guard. Okay, so the, those are, yeah, not important. These are just some slides and statistics. Actually, by the way, bulldogs can have sleep apnea. So that's one thing if you are a dog lover, just know that bulldogs uh, can have uh, sleep apnea. Oftentimes, patients will come to you and they'll get confused. I say, well, can I just get something over the counter? Uh, can I just get something that, well, you know, first of all, we all know you get what you pay for, but there's a lot of things in these ads that are just horrible. Um, there is, there's, they, they make up organizations that don't exist. They'll say rated number one by the American Association of Sleep Medicine. There's no such thing as American Association of Sleep Medicine. There's American Academy, and FDA doesn't really certify anything, you know? So it's, yeah, they, they approve, but, they, you know, so they use words that, fool the general public and they have no idea that they're not even real. So keep in mind. So this is again, snore guards, right? I think I did a post earlier about this on the clinical pearls forum. And again, sure, you can remove the battery on a smoke alarm, that noise uh, that it warns you will go away. But if you have a fire and it's burning down your home, oh my goodness, right? You So you just do a snore guard, there could be underlying, and there's also such a thing as silent sleep apnea. Silent sleep apnea is very dangerous because you know, you're like, I don't have any sleep sleep issues or my wife or my husband doesn't tell me I have any issues and I'm silent, I'm quiet. Uh Uh-uh. Without a polysomnogram or a home sleep test that's validated and looked through with a board certified sleep MD, you just don't know. You need to get that for sure to make sure, okay. And yes, there are patients that have home sleep tests and they have no sleep apnea that I would be more than happy to make a snore guard. And that way I'm already, you know, thorough. I've made sure there's not going to be underlying fire that may take the patient's life away. So that's very, very important to to bear in mind. And so again, this is just, you know, from hormones, from our lack of deep sleep. Uh, uh, we talked about repair, immune system, all of those regulations. REM is when your brain recharges. If you recharge your cell phone, you have to recharge your brain. That's when your body's paralyzed and your brain is, you know, so REM is very, very important. Actually, you, when you lack REM, you'll get REM rebound when you're trying to make up for it because your brain really, really needs that to get its all recharged and re up. So REM sleep is very important. But remember, REM is also paralysis and that's when gravity can become our biggest enemy and create issues. So that's very, very important to keep in mind. And here's kind of a breakdown. Rib's supposed to be 25% of the night. So when I review sleep tests with my patients, I always really try to get to 25. But sometimes the body may be smart and saying, you know, the reason why I only have like 5 or 10% REM is because I'm afraid to die because during REM, everything's paralyzed. And if I don't have a pain airway, so, but I like, no, your brain needs it, right? So if you have an oral appliance, oftentimes what you see, uh, sometimes you may even see a little bit, actually increase a little bit of the HI, but look at the percentage of REM. If there's more REM, of course, there's more vulnerability to have have apnea and hypopnea, but if you're getting more REM, oh, your brain is thanking for it. You need to have REM. You need to be dreaming. You need to have your brain recharged. And then over here on the non-REM side, pay particular attention to stage three. That's the deep delta wave sleep. That's where I was alluding to earlier. A lot of things get recharged. And, and, but that's also when weird things happen. Uh, the parasomnias like sleepwalking, um, all those weird uh, night terrors and stuff like that are stage three stuff. Okay. So 
yeah, that just kind of breaks it down. Some slides. Again, they're here. You guys can look through those. I know I'm already past my one hour. One thing on this slide to keep very important to uh, uh, notice is, is REM increases as the night progresses. So during the early morning hours, you can see that the REM bar increases, but that's also when more heart attacks and stuff happen during the early uh, morning wee hours. So just know that REM is supposed to increase as you sleep longer, but that's also when it's more vulnerable. And also insomnia, I'm telling you this especially with Ambien and all those things um, oh my goodness right so insomnia is actually more prevalent than even sleep apnea it's the number one uh, sleep issue out there but yet what do they do prescribe 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 and what's so sad is here's a study that shows that those people on those sleep agents and stuff like that they have the worst insomnia that's even you know they 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 have so many weird side effects my dad was actually on Ambien one time in the middle of the night I think he was just a complete different person it was so weird but it also increases apnea and and uh, sleep breathing issues. So really think about that. And when they wake up, they're not falling back asleep and they're having longer periods of time to fall asleep. So yeah, I'm not sure really medication is always the answer. It just tends again to create more side effects and issues along with that. So here's some more definitions. So now we can talk about billing. So um, we, we have microdental, they're working with Physician Alliance Group at sleeptest.com and pristine medical billing. And um, I, I would definitely say if you're just getting into it, having your hand held to walk through this because it can be a little bit overwhelming, um, but I like to say, even when I teach uh, seminars live, start off with a group like that. And then later, if you find just like a wonderful employee in the front desk, like I have in Will and others that are just so excited to build medical and they take it as a passion, totally, you can do everything in office and you'll probably, you know, end up saving some more bucks. But when you're jumping into dental sleep medicine, absolutely have, because there's so many coding and things like that. There's narratives that you have to write, uh, but they will guide you. There's so many templates and things like that and then at first like anything in dentistry when you're first doing it you'd be like wow there's so much but then it just becomes repeat and i'm telling you without the aerosols with the life-saving things with um the kids and parents coming to you they're telling you their whole quality of life change oh my god this is why we became healthcare professionals i mean we get this reward over and over again and i'm just telling you it's emotional it's empowering it's just you know gratifying so there's that now make sure you remember that it's a board certified sleep md that does a diagnosis, but there's different uh, ones that can do telemedicine and you can set that up, uh, doc via web, all these different things. If you have any questions, feel free to ask that they can get a board certified CPMD. Once you have the diagnosis, anyone, a nurse practitioner, a, a primary care physician, a DO, a um, ENT, they can write a standing order or prescription for oral appliance therapy. And you need that for the record. But again, yes, you can get a certified nurse practitioner to write, uh, yes, a, a sleep MD has already diagnosed it. Please make an oral appliance for this patient's uh, OS, uh, OSA. And then, of course, um, the billing companies are, are, are out there a lot, but I recommend if you're working with Barker Dental, they have a, a, a partnership with them and they'll help you uh, get connected with that. Remember pre-auth. Pre-auth is so important in uh, sleep medicine because if you are required to do pre-op and you don't do it, you better kiss the money goodbye if you didn't do it and you're supposed to do it. So make sure that if you're jumping into this, your pre auth is done. And generally, if you're working with a medical group like Pristine Medical Billing, they already like have done it a gazillion times. They're gonna be able to catch that and get that in advance. So you don't, you know, all your, your dots are uh, dot, all your T's are crossed and I's are dotted and check marks are checked, okay? So, so there's that. Another thing, be careful on Medicare, okay? So Medicare is anybody 65 years or over. Um, so where we're at in my practice, we're opt-in, non-participating. So what that means is we um, have the patients themselves bill Medicare directly. They sign an advanced beneficiary ABN form and they pay us directly, but we give them the paperwork and they get reimbursed by Medicare. And Medicare reimburses differently depending on what region in the United States you're located at. I know it's really where it's kind of like the dental board exams. You have the rep and you have the nerve, you have this. It's kind of like that with Medicare. They separate different uh, regions in the country and they reimburse. The Northeast region actually reimburses the best. Um, 
I think somewhere in the South, it's the worst, but I think you can get a couple of thousand dollars of reimbursement. Um, but uh, Medicare reimbursement is a global charge. So normally if you break down, like say your sleep exam or your pharyngometer or your CT scan, whatever it is, for Medicare, it's one lump sum. So you kind of kind of think about, now if they have uh, Medicare secondary and they have plans like IJ, there's several of them. Yes, you can totally bill uh, for secondary and yes, they will pay very, very, well uh, for reimbursement so oftentimes if you think about what you get from that compared to like you know a five unit fixed bridge or something major you'll look that you'll think that wow how come i didn't know about dental seed medicine all these years because it is very um, promising it also has a good fee schedule and you're billing medical and also one thing to keep in mind when you do dental seed medicine please put on the medical hat. Your time is super duper important, okay? So medical doctors, they bill by their time. Remember my mom, that example, when she went in, she had a side effect and that only took the doctor about five minutes or so, but she was billed another like um, two, $300. Remember to keep that in mind, you know, because we dentists, like for example, if we numb the patient up, they get unnumbed and they may bite a little different. They have a high spot. Well, what do we do as dentists? Oh, no problem, come back. Um, yeah, well, I'll adjust that. And what are you doing? Okay, now you have PPE, you have overhead, you have utilities, you have your employees. So, you know, in dentistry, we just made ourselves that way. But in medical, don't do that. Medical, you are putting on a medical hat. Your time is important. This is life-saving. This is life-changing. So please keep that in mind. And yes, medical insurance will understand that you're, you know, there's components where you're doing your, your time is important. So uh, keep that in mind. I'm going to skip over this. Uh, if you ever have time, listen to Joy, Joy Koi. He has sleep apnea. This is such a fun Funny video. I want to share that, but we're already over 20 minutes in time. So this is what, usually what happens. But if you do have a chance, look at it. It's funny. And he didn't even know that it was that serious. He just thought he had a snoring problem. And his mom, you know, it's, it's funny. When you get a chance, look at that. And there's three main organizations, the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, the American Sleep and Breathing Academy, and the Academy of uh, Clinical Sleep Disorders Disciplines, ACSD. They all offer credentialing, offer the Diplomat Board Certified status. Uh, you do have to take written exams. You have to turn in actual cases. Uh, generally, it's uh, five detailed hard cases and 10 spreadsheet cases. And of course, uh, like for, uh, I don't think a ABDSM, they used to require you go to a sleep lab or a sleep center and work with a sleep physician and the certified uh, sleep technicians. But now I think they have a master's program where you can do, but all of those things are, are, are available. Um, I'm, I'm triple board certified in all of them. If you have any questions or uh, uh, just feel free to shoot me some questions and stuff. And with that, um, those are some more references. Thank you guys. Um, and right now, uh, Medina, do you have some questions or anything or is everything okay? Did everyone get uh, the whole spiel? <laughs> yeah, we do have questions and thank you for your presentation. By the way, it was very informative. I actually have a French bulldog, so I'm now concerned if he, uh, <laughs> he me up, so I'll have to keep yes. watching him and you know, possibly getting a sleep appliance for him as well. Um, uh -huh. All right, so we have a question. Um, let me check here. Um, let's see. What is the most important thing to do for employee training when implementing um, dental sleep into your practice? I think if you have the ability to, uh, so I'll give you one option that I know SGS offers. Uh, of course, if you can bring them to like an AADSM uh, annual meeting or ASBA, they have separate tracks for the employees. But there's a thing called dental boot camp for the team members. Um, it's just, it's always usually sold out. Sometimes they even do it on a cruise ship, but it's through Sleep Group Solutions. Now, you can always, go, once you become a member of ACSDD or ABDSM, AADSM, they'll have like online um, um, uh, tutorials, webinars, and things like that, that your team members can log into. But I really do believe to really jump in, I think uh, some kind of live involvement would be very, very crucial, especially the front desk, um, uh, getting them to understand uh, the dynamic between medical billing and how to appoint patients, schedule time. Um, but uh, always, uh, if they ever have any questions or any suggestions, you guys do offer, of course, the pristine uh, medical billing group, as well 
because um, I'm free to answer questions. And I promise I always answer them. Sometimes it may take me a few days, but um, you know, I'm pretty busy, but I'll generally try to answer all those questions. Okay, and then the next question is, are many microarousal considered uh, OSA? So microarousals, this is a really good question. What happened was, is for some reason, and, and they really don't know, I know Christian Guilamino, he's like considered one of the father greats. He's no longer with us. He's passed. He's from Stanford University. And to have a definition of an arousal, whether it's an apnea or a hypopnea, it has to be 10 seconds or longer. But particularly women, this is very important, women who are fit and they're exercise, and you think, wow, you know, they're fit, there's no way they can have any sleep breathing issues but then they say you know what like my husband says that I'm not the same person anymore and I'm just tired all the time I'm groggy I'm irritable and then they take a sleep test right and they don't have any apnea or hardly any and they have an AHI let's say of three but the doctor didn't look at the raw data they did not pick up those micro arousals. Those micro arousals, if you have like 200 of them over the night, uh, you better bet that's not normal sleep. That is still fragmented sleep. So what is crazy is, is they don't call that OSA, but the detrimental effects, including getting fibromyalgia and all those other issues, you totally get that, but they call it UARS, upper area resistance syndrome. And UARS, oh, there's so many things tied to it, the issue is sometimes medical insurance companies, they may be sticklers where they have to have like an OSA diagnosis. But if you work with the board uh, certified CPMD or if you work with physicians to write a letter of necessity and say, look, I mean, this patient, I'm sorry. Or the patient might just say, you know what? I've tried everything. I've tried all these medications and stuff like that. And my life is just falling apart. You know, you may come into a different I don't know, cash fee deal, whatever that you do, because really oral appliance therapy is very effective for UARS and those microarousals are very important. Okay, um, next question is, will this presentation slide be shared or probably the recording would be available for future viewing? Uh, yes, this yes. particular one uh, will be uploaded onto Microdental's website one week from today. And we do have other ones that you can view as well. And definitely use those references because those references are powerful. If you're sleeping, speaking to other doctors, physicians, ENTs, and whatnot, though, you know, when you go in the medical world, they don't care about your opinion. They just want evidence-based, evidence-based, evidence-based. And you can see that, even you know, with COVID, don't talk to me unless you have some kind of research or some kind of cite citation. So make sure you utilize those because, uh, you know, I kind of went through them fast based on time, Medina, but they're there. I'm not sure if all the videos work, but some of those videos are really cool. If you can, you know, share them, download, play them for your uh, patients or even for your team members some of them are funny and whatnot but yeah yeah um okay next question would be what appliance would you use for uars all of those appliances would be uh, uh, uh the main thing is is you want to make sure that it's comfortable and um generally with uars and women and especially the ones that i labeled that are kind of like um thin and healthy, I, I would make a petite one, you know, minimalistic as possible. Um, so for example, like, you know, uh, Respire has minimum ones uh, that are just, like I said, with a metal uh, lingual apron or whatnot uh, uh, that you can have on a Respire Blue. Um, Moses, all of them could be uh, made for URS. Okay. And um, what are some obstacles you have encountered with medical billing? Some medical billing is one thing that is very, very important is if you have a medical billing company, you will not run into this, but if you start doing it on your own, this is evil. This is very important that you know this, okay? So I'm just giving a hypothetical, okay? Let's say you charge out an oral appliance, the code E0486NU for $5,000. Let's just say that, hypothetical. There's, depending on where you're at, you know, if you're at uh, rural areas, if you need gap exception, whatever, whatnot. And all of a sudden, you get this call from a representative of the medical insurance company. Actually, that is just a person doing a side job that gets paid on commission. Okay, so they'll literally do this. Okay, this is crazy. Okay, they'll say, well, Dr. Who, yes, we see that you've submitted for your oral appliance for $5,000. And um, I'm just going to let you know that right now, if you give me permission, I can cut you a check for $2,200. Um, and if you take it, um, yeah, we'll send it check i promise you like tonight you'll get in the mail and you're like oh well gosh that's not what i built out for but um i'll take it 
Okay, so that's scenario number one. I'm going to tell you what happens after you take it, though. So, so, so be cognizant of that. Let's say I said, well, no, two thousand two hundred dollars. I can't even pay for you know I have my overhead, my lab bill, blah blah. blah. And you say no, and then oh, they go, okay, they hang up the phone, and three days later, literally, they'll call you and they say, oh, so I talked to my supervisor, and you know what? Um, I'm telling you, I've never seen this, but what if we paid you $3,100 instead of $2,200? Will you take that now? And I'll send the check right away. And you're like, oh, oh, I'll take it. Okay. And it's like, okay, if you take that, they'll give you the check for $3,100, but they make a global uh, label on you. So from that point on, if your practice ever bills that same medical insurance, you're never going to get $3,100. Uh, more. You're always going to get $31 or less. So medical insurance companies, you've got to have to really be watchful. But if you have like a billing company to help you out, they'll help you kind of, you know, steer through some of that. As a matter of fact, I did this same conversation one time with a lady that called me and I said, you know, I just can't believe those people. Well, she pretended that she wasn't one of them, but she actually was. And she says, well, I'm going to send something like that and we won't glo uh, global label you, blah, blah, blah. And then she sent the facts over. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe this, you know, but I get it. You know, some people, they need to make money and that's what they're, you know, that's their whole pr profession. So uh, teach their own, but really you just got to be careful. Okay. And then we have another question. Uh, where do we start? I'm not getting younger and won't be doing triple board certification. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, you absolutely don't have to have the, the triple board and stuff. I think there's one thing that, um, again, I've had disclosures. Uh, so yes, when I teach for secret solutions, they do give me an honor and stuff like that. But I think if you're pressed for time or let's say you're just a young grad and you're like having student loans up the wazoo and you need to start doing something. Um, I think that, for example, some of these two day uh, seminars like uh, Secret Solutions, there's also other camps I didn't mention. There's Spear, there's Coist, there's uh, Pinky. There's a whole bunch of them out there um, that have kind of condensed programs. I, I myself, I teach SG, for SGS and they have a, they're the only ones that I know that have a turnkey system where they actually go into your office, they work with your team members, they give you free uh, tuition to uh, for I think three or four of your team members to attend that boot camp. So it's a whole thing that they do. But what they do, they are equipment um, connected uh, uh, company. I obviously believe in their equipment. I use their equipment. So I also teach for them. Um, but <clears throat> there is, uh, of course, a cost for that. But when you do that, they really kind of gives you all the bells and whistles. That probably be the fastest one. Um, you know, if you do have the time, though, like you want to you become passionate like me, I would try to go for one of the diplomates. Uh, actually, the ACSDD one, if I go up a slide, the one right here, I have a code, the Academy of Clinical Sleep Disorder disciplines where it's completely online based at your own pace and if you want to uh, I guess uh, go through my credential they can email I can give you a code they give you a discount and they have two tracks with that one is the fellowship track the fellowship track I think all you need to do is a written exam and I don't even think there's a case submission with that. Now, of course, you want to do the diplomate, the uh, board certification track. That will be uh, cases and other things like that, too. So uh, so that's kind of my broad answer to that. But, yes, there are groups that give, like, a two-day seminar, hands-on, all that. And there's, you know, the whole thing, like, getting accredited or even just getting a fellowship and sleep. Okay. Um, all right. We have one last question. Have you ever treated a child with sleep apnea and tests may be hard to do with children? How is OSA diagnosed in a child? A very good question. Yes, I have all of those. So in children, that's when you're in a whole different, you're not in the static appliances anymore. You're in growth guidance appliances, ortho. You're actually looking at cranial facial development. And oh my gosh, you know, so many times, again, big pharma, you see ADHD, you see, you know, when I was a kid, they didn't have all these like a speed medication, Adderall, or, you know, all these things that they prescribe children. Uh, they're actually literally speed, right, to, to try to address that and they're not breathing at night simply there and there's a, a video Connor Deegan uh, did that was fantastic about his life remember you're absolutely right but if you can have a parent witness the child having sleep issues like the Gaspar era I'm talking about my own two-year-old okay you record that if they go to an ENT or a doctor and if that doctor tries to ignore they 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 will not you just say I have exactly evidence right here my kid has sleep 
breathing disorder, has airway issues. Why is this important? Because when you do a sleep exam on a child, it has to be a polysomnogram or a NOx3. NOx3 is relatively new. It is a home sleep test, um, but it's, you know, it's wonderful, but not everybody has it's new. But when they do a polysomnogram on a child, they need two sleep techs per sleep test. So the lab and the sleep MD doesn't make as much money. So from a money standpoint, they're like, it's kind of like the ENTs with tonsillectomy. They don't make much money from it. They don't get reimbursed. They're like, eh, if I can just give it. But you feel like, no, excuse me. I've just recorded my son. My son is gasping for air. My daughter is like, you know, breathing through their mouth, choking at night. Like, oh my God. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. You get my kid a sleep test. This is absolutely related to their performance at school. They're, they're thriving. They're growing. They're everything like that. So you, you record them because we have cell phones. It's easy to record. Number one. Number two, even though the home sleep test or excuse me, the polysomnogram sleep center requires two or the NOx3. If you just have enough passion, they'll do it. And when they see that, absolutely. Medical insurance, everything should cover for whatever treatment that you offer. And then remember this big dotion. In adults, when you have AHI of five or higher, you have mild apnea, right? Then 15, moderate, then 30, severe. In a child, when a child's growing and a child's thriving, they should have zero. So when you have an HI of one, your child has sleep apnea. So that's to be diagnosed officially as having sleep apnea. All your child has to have HI is just a one, not a five even, a one. An adult, like the lady I was saying with fibromyalgia or UARS, yeah, they may get an HI of three and then the doctor doesn't look at the raw data and they get overlooked. But for a child, uh-uh, one is a HI of OSA, okay? Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. That's going to do it for the questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. It was a very informative presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Who. Please join us um, for our parent company, Modern Dental. They'll be hosting a webinar on um, sleep as well. It is with OSA University and it'll be September 30th. So check that out and register if you want. Um, thank you guys so much and it'll do it for us. Have Thank you so day. much. Bye. All right. Sleep well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. -bye.